Good morning and welcome to Church of the Resurrection here on Capitol Hill. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. It's great to have you worshiping with us online as you tune into this service on Sunday morning. We are gathered here in this exact same space. After the service, weather permitting, there will be a children's chapel at the southeast corner of Lincoln Park at 1115. Following that, at 11.45 this morning, we'll gather at the southeast corner and at the northeast corners for Holy Eucharist. So if you're at home worshiping there, we hope that you'll, you'll be able to join us this morning, later this morning, after this service. And now today is a very special day. It's uh, All Saints Day, and All Saints Day is a time where we remember those who have come before us. Later on this morning in the Creed, we're going to confess that we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. For the church to be Catholic, it means, among other things, that the church as a body of Christ transcends all boundaries, geographic, temporal, and even the boundaries of death. And so today we remember those saints who have gone before and have passed on the faith to us. Some of them are great heroes that we know only through their writings or stories about their lives. Others are those who are our own family members or those who have come before us in this place and who have uh, made a way for us to hear about Jesus and to follow him. And so we uh, remember them today and we give thanks for their lives and we look to them as examples and we remember that one day we will all be one together alive resurrected in the presence of Christ. So please join me in this special acclamation. Worthy is the Lord our God to receive glory and honor and power. For in the multitude of your saints, you have surrounded us with so great a cloud of witnesses that we, rejoicing in their fellowship, may run with patience the race that is set before us and together with them, may receive the unfading crown of glory. I invite you now to join me as we pray the Collect for Purity, preparing our hearts to enter into God's presence through song. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able and join us as we sing our first hymn this morning. For all the saints who from their labors rest to thee by faith before the world confess thy name Oh, Jesus, before
Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. I invite you at this time to kneel or be seated as you are able, and let us make a humble confession of our sins to Almighty God, first in silence and then aloud together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand now and hear these words of assurance for all who truly turn to Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's continue singing his praises now. in the sight of the
in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up higher and higher. And he will lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up higher and higher, and he will lift Memphis Radcliffe's and we live in Eastern Market. My name is Kelly and I've been going to Res for about five years. My name is Jeff. I've been going to Res for 11 years. Please join us in praying the Collect for Children. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you have blessed our congregation with the joy and care of children. Give us courage, patience, and wisdom as we bring them up in the faith that they might never know a day apart from you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Today we are taking a special break from our lessons in the Old Testament 
to celebrate a holiday in the church year. I wonder, did some of you already celebrate a holiday this week? That's right, Halloween was yesterday, and some of you might have dressed up in fun costumes, gotten to eat candy, and maybe you painted or carved a pumpkin. But did you know that Halloween is not the only holiday this week? There's another one, and it's today. It's called All Saints Day, and we celebrate it as a way to remember the saints of the church. Some of these saints are very famous, and some of them are not. But we remember them all for their example of faith throughout the history of the church. I wonder, what is a saint? It's kind of a funny word. It's not one we use a lot. A saint is a person who loves God and loves people. Let's make our hearts quiet and listen to these words that Jesus says in the Gospels. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one lights a lamp to put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand where it gives light for everyone in the whole house. And you, like the lamp, must shed light among your fellow people so that they may see the deeds you do and give glory to your Father in heaven. In God's good words, he says that Jesus is the light of the world. He is the only person who perfectly loved God and loved other people. Let's light the Christ candle today to remember that Jesus is the light of the world. Through Jesus, God has welcomed us to be a part of his family. And it's a huge family. People from all of time and all of history. People of all nations and languages. People who have done big, famous things for God. And people who have been faithful to God in small and everyday ways. Because we are all in God's family, he has called us to be lights to the world, too. I wonder, what does it look like to be a light to the world? Would you like to learn about some saints and see today? Some of the saints we remember on All Saints Day are heroes of the faith who have done big things for God that people remember in history. They're written in books. People study about them. These are big ways that people have shined the light of Jesus to the world. This is St. Paul. You, remind, you might remember Paul from our lessons this summer. Paul's name was once Saul. And Paul had a life-changing encounter with Jesus that turned his life inside out and upside down. Paul went from arresting and persecuting those who followed Jesus to becoming a follower of Jesus himself. Paul would spend his whole life telling people about Jesus. He was put in prison. Eventually, he was even killed for his faith, for spreading the gospel of Jesus. Let's light a candle today to remember Paul.
This is St. Augustine. He lived many years ago. He was a bishop from North Africa, and he was a great theologian. Do you know what a theologian is? It's someone who does lots of studying and thinking about the nature of God, who God is, and what we think about God. Augustine was a great writer, too. In fact, today you can even read many of his works and the things that he's written. And people still study what he has to say and what he wrote about to learn about God. He's influenced a lot of what we believe. St. Augustine used his gifts, his gifts of knowledge, of thinking and writing, to share the light of Jesus with the whole world. Let's light another candle today to remember St. Augustine. This is St. Teresa of Calcutta. Some people called her Mother Teresa, and she lived just a short time ago. In fact, many of your parents probably remember when she was still alive. She was a nun, and she spent her life caring for the poorest of the poor in India and around the world. She set up schools for children to learn, she cared for the sick, for the blind, and for the disabled. And she lived among the hungry and the homeless and cared for them. St. Teresa used all that she had to serve and care for the poor and hurting. And in this way, she was a light to the world. Let's light a candle today. to remember St. Teresa. There are some saints who we remember throughout history who have done big, important things for God. But did you know that not all saints are famous? Some saints are people who have walked with God faithfully every day in the ordinary ways of life. And in doing so, they have been lights to the world. Many of these saints are people that we love, people who have lived before us, maybe older loved ones that have been examples to us, that have shown us what it means to love Jesus and to follow him. And All Saints Day is also a day where we take time to remember them. Even though they're not here with us anymore and they're with Jesus, we can remember how they were an example to us and they showed us how to be lights to the world. Let's light another candle today. As we remember, people in our hearts, the people in your lives that have shown you what it looks like to follow Jesus. Did you know that you are also a saint? In the Bible, Paul, who we talked about earlier, calls all Christians, all people who through Jesus are a part of God's family, saints. He calls us saints, you and me. And we are called to be lights, to love God and to love others. I wonder, how is God asking you to be a light to the world around you? To shine the light of Jesus to everyone you meet. I wonder, how might you love God? I wonder, how might you... You love people around you. Let's light another candle today.
This is the candle for you and me to remember that we are saints and we are called to be lights to the world. Let's pray together. Lord Christ, your saints have been lights to the world in every generation, and you have called us to be one family in the body of Christ. Help us to follow in the footsteps of the saints who have gone before us, so that we may be made worthy to enter with them into your kingdom, where you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Please join us in praying the Collect of the Day. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. Hi, we're the Moors. We live in Arlington, Virginia, and we've been going to res for several years. Our psalm today is Psalm 34, 1 through 10. We will be reading responsibly by whole verse. This is Taste and See, uh, that the Lord is good. It's a psalm of David. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Casey Rath. I live in Eckington, and I have been going to res for almost 12 years. Uh, I'm getting a behind-the-camera assist today from Katie Monroe that you'll hear at the end of the reading. Our reading today from the New Testament is James 4, 1 through 12. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly, to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, hello, I'm Dan Clare. I'm one of the pastors at the Church of the Resurrection, and we're continuing in our sermon series on the book of James. 
And today, James chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, which gets really at the root of the problem that keeps us hurting one another. And James gives us a surefire solution on how to make it stop. As we turn to this passage together, let me pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word sent to us through the epistle of James. We thank you that when you speak to us, you have words of life and hope, that nothing you give us is too hard, and by the power of your Spirit, we can follow you according to your word. And so we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to understand what you have to say to us and help us to live faithfully according to it. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the wonderful things about the epistle of James is that he's so simple and direct, straightforward and easy to understand. And now as we turn to James chapter 4, he zeroes in on the root of the problem. As he does so, he's at pains to show us just how serious the problem is. In essence, what James asks at the beginning of chapter 4 is, why? Why do you keep on murdering one another? Look at verses 1 and 2. What causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Now you may be thinking, I'm not perfect and I'm not ashamed to admit when I'm wrong, but murder? Really? Yes, really. In James's day, there may well have been some Jewish Christians who were unhappy with Gentile Christians coming into the church, and they may have conducted some measure of violence against them. We have no historical record of this, but certainly in the centuries that followed, there were different times when Christians took up arms against other Christians, certainly after the great schism between East and West, and in the Reformation period with the European Wars of Religion, and of course, during our own civil war here. But even setting aside conflicts involving both church and state, we know from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that blood doesn't have to be shed for there to be the stain of murder on our hearts. And yes, I do think James, the brother of Jesus, has directed his question to our hearts, asking, why? Why do you keep on murdering one another, if not in the flesh? then in your heart. Perhaps it's those with whom you disagree, maybe those with different political views than you and whose voice and opinions you feel are taking us and our government in the wrong direction. And deep in your heart, you wish that they would just shut up and shut up forever. Or perhaps there's a leader in the church with whom you disagree or whose actions or whose priorities have not blessed you and you've decided to oppose them, whether in words and, or in actions or only in your heart. And you'll treat them like they're dead until they either step down or leave. Or maybe there are parishioners who drive you crazy or who have been blessed in ways that you haven't. Maybe they're married and you're not, or maybe they have a nicer house than you do, or a better job than you do, and you're jealous, and even though they're still very much alive, they're dead to you. It's hard to believe that this kind of thing happens in the church, but it does, and it's not uncommon at all that someone will leave the church out of jealousy over God's blessings on the life of someone else. Rather than address the problem in a mature way, they walk away and leave the whole church for dead. Or sometimes others will decide to stick around, but not address the problem. And so their anger just continues to simmer and grow and bubble over and do harm within the congregation. So James, I think, is putting his finger on an issue that's deadly serious within the church. But in case you think that James is talking about someone else, he takes his argument one step further at the end of verse 2 and on into verse 3. James connects the murder problem with a prayer problem, saying, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly 
to spend it on your passions. The prayer problem, James says, can manifest in two ways. Either you don't pray at all, or if you do pray, you do so with the wrong motives. Either way, it's a warning sign that your faith has gotten seriously off track. You've quit trusting in God and you've taken matters into your own hands. If you don't pray at all, then it's likely that you have concluded, whether consciously or not, that the true power is really in your own hands rather than God's. And one sure sign of this is whenever you think about the person that you're sideways with, rather than talking to God about them, you begin thinking of how you could take them down a notch or two. Perhaps you post something on the internet about them, maybe to refute or embarrass them, or maybe you can slander them in private conversation with other friends in the church, or maybe you can register their phone number with some telemarketers. That's always a great way to get even. And you find that you've just spent an hour daydreaming about how to get revenge on this person when you could have been praying for them instead. If this in any way describes you, then it's a sign that your faith has gotten off track. Or perhaps you do pray, James says, but you do so with wrong motives, not seeking to draw near to God or to glorify God, but instead to use God as a means to gratify your own desires, to get him to simply rubber stamp whatever it is you want. Of course, God isn't keen to answer those prayers because, as we'll see in a moment, it only contributes to the problem. And besides, if you think about the Lord's Prayer, you'll know that this sort of vending machine approach to God is the opposite of the way that prayer works. When Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, he invited us first to speak to God about his kingdom and his will being done here on earth before we bring our own petitions before him. So again, just like the murder problem in verses 1 and 2, these prayer problems in verses 2 and 3 are yet another warning sign that something is seriously wrong with our faith, and it's time to make serious corrections. But to do so, we need to get to the root of the problem. I used to play golf. Some years ago, uh, there was a fellow that I would play with from time to time, and he had a terrible slice. Now, that's when you hit the ball with a kind of spin unintentionally, and it veers off to the right. My friend was taller than me. He was stronger than me, and he could certainly have hit the ball a lot further than me, but I could always outdistance him because I could hit the ball straight. Now, to get to the root of the problem, what my friend needed to do was to learn a new swing, one that wouldn't slice. But that would have taken a lot of time and work, a lot of hours of practice, and probably a lot of money. So instead, he took the easy way out. He tried to compensate for the problem. He would line up to the left, and he would hit the ball in this direction and watch as it corrected back to the middle. Well, all of that energy put into the spin meant that he never could go very far with his hits, and I could always outdistance him, and that's why I loved to play him. I could always win. Getting to the root of the problem often takes a lot more work than a quick fix. But the quick fix is rarely adequate, is it? Getting to the root of the problem is worth the effort if it leads to a permanent solution. So what's the root of the problem in the church? You've heard it said that what's wrong with the church today is that it's more defined by what we're against than what we're for. They say that we're haters when we really should be lovers. And the simple solution is for us to stop being so negative. Well, I say to you that the quick fix won't solve the problem because our root problem isn't loving too little. Rather, it's loving too much, and solving the problem is going to take a lot more work. Look at verse 4. James says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The root of the, pro of the problem, James says, isn't loving too little. It's adultery. We're lovers of far too much. 
Earlier in the service, we heard Jesus' summary of the Old Testament. All of the law and the prophets, Jesus said, hang on just two commandments. First, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And secondly, to love your neighbor as yourself. And while these may seem utterly impossible, it wasn't originally, originally contrary to human nature. It's the way God made us. We were made to be lovers of God first and then of neighbor. But sin inverted our loves. We love ourselves more than we love those around us, and we love our neighbors and other created things more than the Creator. God knows. He always knows. And once again, here in James chapter 4, God calls us out on it, saying, You adulterous people. Actually, if you look at the footnotes of your Bible, you may see that the verse actually says, you adulteresses. It could have said adulterers, using the masculine form that is used elsewhere in the New Testament. But James uses the feminine word, adulteresses. And this is intentional in order to frame the issue, not having to do really about gender, but to frame the issue in terms of fidelity and order in a context in which men had the higher authority in that society. The adulteress in that day would have been someone who secretly loved another because she was unsatisfied with her husband. So what James is saying to us here is that the reason we haven't loved God with our whole hearts is because we too are unsatisfied with him. We're unsatisfied with what he has done for us. He hasn't blessed us in the ways we want. So we prefer not only another lover, but also another authority, another Lord. We have betrayed God for another Lord, which James here in this verse defines as friendship with the world. And a little bit later on in verse 7, he defines as ha diabolos, the devil. In the next couple of verses, James goes on to prove this point by describing in verse 5 how the spirit that God made to dwell in us is restless under authority. But God gives us grace, he says in verse 6, when we humble ourselves before him. So again, the root issue, according to James, is one of fidelity and authority. We want God's blessings, but we don't want his sovereignty. We want his favor, but not his rule. And it's evident in the way that we treat other Christians. It's evident also in our prayer life, or lack thereof. And it's evident in our pride. We do not take kindly to anyone calling us unfaithful adulteresses, even James. But deep inside, we should know that James is right about this. The root of the problem lies not out there with others, but within, inside of each of us. But making a permanent change, boy, that feels like so much work, so much time. So we keep making excuses and shifting the blame, and we keep chasing after other lovers while cheating on the Lord. But in the next section, verses 7 through 10, James offers us a surefire solution. Before we give up making uh, before we give up on making a permanent change that will fix this, we should at least consider this surefire solution that James proposes. Take a look at these verses with me. He says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. It sounds really, really hard, doesn't it? And I won't lie to you by telling you that you can solve this root problem with no work, no effort, no difficulty. But it's important that you do know that the hardest part of the work has already been done for us. And it's been done by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Savior, not us. He died on the cross for us. So what we have to do then is simply to follow him. We have to turn away from other lords 
and entrust our lives to him. You may not have heard it put this way before because so often the way Christianity is presented in the modern world is something like this, to accept Jesus into your heart and to go to heaven when you die. It's a lousy distillation of the good news. It's not an accurate invitation, at least according to the way that Jesus used to invite people into his kingdom. Because the way Jesus would always do it is to say, come and follow me. In verse 7, James paraphrases Jesus' invitation this way. He says, submit yourselves therefore to God, which is just another way of talking about conversion. Jesus did the hard work of salvation for us. Now it's our responsibility to follow him. And what does that look like? Well, it's pushing away one Lord in order to draw near to another. In a very similar passage to this one, the Apostle Peter warns us out of his own experience that our adversary, not our Lord, but our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It's in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. And if you let him, he will gobble you up. But if you resist him, James says in this passage, he will flee from you. I've been reading through Dante's Divine Comedy with some friends over the past few months. And there's a moment right in the middle of the poem when the serpent shows up among a band of Christians who are making their way to the gate of paradise. Dante is frightened by the serpent, but nobody else is, because as soon as they resist him, the serpent skitters off in terror. It's a lovely image, and it's what James is telling us here. It's also been my experience. The devil keeps coming around again and again and again. There's no end to it. I don't expect there will be until I meet the Lord face to face. Sometimes, once in a while, it happens in really obvious ways. The devil overplays his hand, and I know it's him. But far more frequently, it happens in this dull drip, drip, drip of his distractions away from intimacy with God and with other believers. But I've found that whenever I do resist him, he flees. So how do you resist the devil? Verse 8, draw near to God, for when you draw near to God, he will draw near to you, and the devil must flee. Why does it work this way? Well, who's the adulteress? Not God. It's me. It's you. Who left in the first place? We did. And who took the initiative at great cost to repair the breach and win us back? Well, it's God. So what are you waiting for? He's already come out to look for you. He's standing there on the road with his arms held open wide. All you have to do is come into his embrace. Step into his arms and he will surround you with the highest of all loves, which is his own. Well, what's this? You say you're still a mess? That's okay. That's okay. You can confess your adultery to him and he will cleanse your hands and your heart, James says. As you come to him in humility, he will restore you both inside and out. The debt has already been paid. Our entry ticket has already been purchased. We are free to come into his presence because of Jesus' sacrificial death, which is what makes us clean. And so as we come humbly before him, verse 10, he will lift us up higher and higher as the song goes. As Jesus said to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All the blessings that we ever want are found through the love of God. By humbling ourselves and repenting of our waywardness, we find our heart's desires fulfilled in him. And finally, the last couple of verses that we're reading today, verses 11 and 12, back up what James is saying. There's proof that getting to the root of the problem will resolve the surface issues that he he addressed at the beginning of this chapter. If we keep on sleeping with the enemy, well, we'll keep on murdering one another. 
But if we return to the Lord, if we come into his embrace, if we draw near to him as he draws near to us, submitting ourselves to him and his word, then we will stop speaking evil against one another. For, James says in verse 11, the one who does these things, who speaks evil of another, has usurped God's authority, not only in speaking evil against a brother, but also, in a way, speaking evil against God's law. God has forbidden us from speaking evil of one another, and when we, when we go against him, we are speaking evil of his rule. This is kind of like Thomas Jefferson, the one who sits in judgment over God's law, is like old TJ, cutting out the parts of the Bible that he didn't like and pasting together the parts that he does like. TJ may have been great, but he wasn't that great. Only one sits in authority over all things, and that's God himself. When we submit ourselves to the Lord, it frees us up from the crushing weight of having to decide which scriptures are true or false. To have, and having to decide who is in and who is out. Who to love and who to hate. It frees us up from having to decide metaphorically who lives or dies. And those in the church who annoy you or with whom you disagree or those whom you envy, well, you can entrust them all to the Lord. He'll take care of them. Just simply return to the Lord. Draw near to him. His arms are open wide. He's more than willing to draw, to draw near to you. As I close, I want to say just one more thing about uh, James that he doesn't leave us right at this point. There's still more than a chapter to go. And in the verses that remain, he's going to encourage us to find the spiritual help that we need, not only in the Lord, but also in the community of believers that are around us. It's true that you're utterly safe within the arms of God, but you won't know how to grow in maturity as a Christian without the help of other Christians. Part of what it means to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord is also to humble ourselves before one another. If you need help resisting the devil, why not ask some other Christians who have some experience doing this? It's very likely that they need your help in doing so like you need theirs. If you need to learn how to draw near to God, why not ask some others in the church how they do it? It's not anything to be ashamed of, and the more people you ask, the richer you'll be. And if you need help letting go of some hurt, or disappointment, or jealousy, or anything else, ask someone in the church who has some experience with such things. It's the nature of God's grace to flow through those who are around us, to help us all together grow in the likeness of him. It's also the nature of God's grace that the more that you give away, the more you have. And it grows within the community to make the community more and more like the Lord Jesus. With that, it should make us all the more eager to love one another as we love God. Will you pray? Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the hope that we find in this passage to love one another, and to draw near to you. Help us to live according to these words. Give us hope in these dark times as we trust in you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting
What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Foley Beach, our Archbishop, and Steve Breedlove, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially our President Donald Trump, our Mayor Muriel Bowser, and Governors Larry Hogan of Maryland and Ralph Northam of Virginia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I now invite you to add your own petitions at home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As Christ our Savior has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hi, we're Bill and Lou Bailey Marr, and this is our grandson, Jack. We live in Cascade, Maryland, and we've been attending Res for about 15 years. Please join us in making a confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. 
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Greet one another in the peace of Christ. If you're worshiping at home with others, greet them with a handshake or hug or a kiss. Also, if you uh, have the time and inclination, I encourage you to reach out to someone that you haven't talked to in a while. Uh, send them a text message, an email, share the peace of Christ with them. Of course, a great way to see some folks and to, to share greetings of peace is to join us this morning after the service. If you've got little ones, we'll be meeting in Lincoln Park at 11.15 a.m., and uh, that will be for a children's chapel. Uh, everyone, though, will be gathering at the southeast corner of Lincoln Park at 11.45 this morning for a service of Holy Eucharist. Some instructions were sent out to you uh, previous to this. If you don't have those, just show up, come to the southeast corner. We'll help you uh, to find the right place to go. I want to inform you about some other things going on in the life of our church. Uh, every Monday through Friday morning, we have at 8 o'clock a service of morning prayer. This is a time to show up with your coffee. You can still be in your pajamas. And to, to be there for half an hour to pray with others and to take part in a short Bible study. Currently, the group is looking at some selected psalms and seeing how those teach us how we ought to be praying. Do climb in. It's a Zoom format. You can find the link on our website. We also have a service of prayer this Tuesday night. As you may or may not have heard, it's Election Day. And so we're gathering people uh, at 8 o'clock for an hour to have a service of evening prayer, just to pray for the church's witness, to pray for our country, to pray for one another. We realize this is a fraught and stressful time for a lot of people for various reasons. This is a space for you to gather just to pray and to hear a little bit of encouragement from God's word. So do climb on and join us. Uh, that will be a, a good time together. We've also got res groups that meet. They're all meeting weekly uh, during the pandemic. If you're interested in getting plugged into a small group, contact me. My contact information is on our website, and uh, I'd love to help you get connected to one of those virtual res groups. There are some other buttons on our website, ways for you to tell us if you're new. We'd love to help you get plugged in, put you on our listserv, put you on our emails, uh, give you some more information about the church, and answer any questions you may have. There are also ways to request help. There's the Res 911 button. You can also offer to give help through the volunteer button. All sorts of different things there. Do have a look there, and, and we'd love to hear from you. This is the time in our service where we typically stop and worship God uh, not only through song, but through the giving of material gifts, through our finances. This is a way that we recognize God as the giver of all that we have, and, and also the way that we uh, continue to support the work and the ministry of the gospel in our city. We obviously don't take an offering virtually, but I point you to the fact that we have a giving button, and we thank you for your continued generosity to our church during this time. With that, will you stand and join me as we sing our final hymn this morning? i 
Well, it's been good to worship with you this morning. Thank you for being here. I'll remind you as this comes to a close, if you're watching it at the 930 time slot, uh, that we're going to be gathering together this morning, uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, in Lincoln Park at the southeast corner, 1115 a.m. for Children's Chapel, 1145 for our Holy Eucharist. Hope to see you there today. And with that, let me send you out with the benediction. All our problems... We send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties. We send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works. We send to the cross of Christ. And all of our hopes. We set on the risen Christ. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.